Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today it is time for the second video in my bookshelf series where I take you through my entire bookish collection shelf by shelf. Now I realized after filming the first video, I didn't actually give you an overview of my shelves so that you could see what we were working with, where I was starting, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a clip of that here. Okay y'all, so this is an overview of my shelves. You can see up here that I just have a bunch of the larger pops that are not actually fitting on my Funko Pop shelves and since I'm not putting books up there at this time it just works so over here on the left you have my book of the month collection which takes up the first two shelves and then most of this third shelf right here and then the rest of this is basically contemporary fiction all of the books are organized by author and then by size so like right here you have the larger and then you get into the smaller and this is pretty much all of my remaining young adult contemporary fiction this half shelf right here is all tbr um, and that will be filled more very very soon so that's going to change a lot this is my sci-fi and fantasy bookcase right here it is both young adult and adult i don't separate them this is all of my paperback i tend to gravitate more towards hardcovers just for aesthetic purposes but if a book is not offered in hardcover then i will get paper Paperback, and so that's why it's only on this half shelf here. I do plan on doing separate videos for the TBR and the paperbacks. I'm not going to go shelf by shelf on these ones. I'm going to do bookcase by bookcase. And then over here is all my suspense thrillers. The first three and a half shelves are suspense thrillers. Please ignore this stack right here. That is a stack that I have to haul. And then down here is like a little unhaul pile. This is just where I'm kind of keeping track of those things. Eventually I won't have the room to do that. Then down here we have literary fiction, historical fiction, and nonfiction. So these are all the things that don't really fit into the typical contemporary fiction genre. So again, this is just kind of an overview of what we are working with today. So today we are starting with my second book of the month shelf. This is on the leftmost bookcase and the second shelf down. Now before I got into that shelf, I did want to quickly touch upon two books that were supposed to be on the first shelf but were not because they were actually in an unhaul pile at the time I was filming the video. And then a little bit later on, I changed my mind and decided to keep them. So they are now back on the first shelf where they belong. And so I wanted to go ahead and be fair and include them. These are both books by Lucy Foley. So the first one I have is The Guest List. So this is set on a remote island off the coast of Ireland, and it follows a group of people who are all gathering for a wedding. Now, at the beginning of the story, you know something has happened. You don't necessarily know what has happened, and you don't know to whom. So it kind of gives you a little bit of big little lies vibes in that aspect. And you are following, I believe it's about six different perspectives as they go through the events of the wedding leading up to what actually happened. And then you're getting snippets of the present as you're finding out what actually happened and to whom. One of the reasons why I was going to unhaul this is because I only gave this a three stars. I absolutely did have a lot of fun with this book. It had a lot of over the top drama. It was definitely entertaining. And even though there were a lot of personal Perspectives. I feel like Lucy Foley did a great job of giving them distinction with their own backgrounds and things of that nature. But on the same note, there was quite a bit packed in here. And as a character driven reader, it's very difficult for me to truly enjoy a story with so many character perspectives because you're not getting a lot of time with each individual character. So there's not that emotional connection. And I just knew when I finished it that this wasn't really going to stick with me. And that's really the case. Like I remember who the victim was in this story and I remember who did it and a little bit about the why, but that's really it. I don't remember all of the characters. I don't remember all of their backstories or things of that nature. But overall, this was a fun time and it kind of reminded me of my recent experience with An Unwanted Guest by Sherry Lapina, which had similarities in terms of you have an isolated thriller, you have a large cast of characters, somebody ends up dead, you don't know who did it, but you know it has to be somebody in the vicinity. And I realized that this doesn't necessarily have to be an absolute favorite for me to keep on my shelves if I can remember having a great reading experience with it and if I'm willing to continue with Lucy Foley as an author. So that's the reason I decided to put this and the next book back on my shelves. And that next book is The Paris Apartment. So I feel like this book waited until the very end to actually be interesting. This follows our main character, Jess, who has a abruptly left her life in England. She needed to get away and she decides to go visit her brother Josh who has recently moved to Paris. Josh knows that she is coming. He is preparing for her arrival. But once Jess gets there, Josh is nowhere to be found. He's not answering her calls, her texts. His wallet and personal effects are still in his apartment. She just knows something terrible has happened to him, but she just doesn't know what. And so she takes it upon herself to investigate Josh's disappearance by interviewing all of the residents in the apartment complex. So again, this is another situation where you have a large cast of characters and you're getting
seeing their perspectives, seeing what their relationship was to Josh, what secrets they may be hiding, etc. And so if you've read the guest list, you'll notice that there are those similarities in structures. You have the isolation in some aspect because you're dealing with this very close knit group of residents who aren't really willing to share their secrets. You have that large cast of characters where you're not really getting a lot of time with any one particular perspective. And for the vast majority of this book, I would say easily 75% of this book, I was pretty bored. I wasn't liking a lot of the characters. I really didn't care about their perspectives. I wasn't intrigued to find out what happened to Josh. But then you get to the last 25% and Lucy Foley just really turns it around. I enjoyed the twist of the story and a little bit of the background of what actually happened. So this ended up eventually being one again that I had fun with. And because of that, I decided to go ahead and keep this and the guest list on my shelves. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and give Lucy Foley one more shot. And if I enjoy that third book, I will absolutely continue with her. But if I don't, then I think I will go ahead and let these go. But for now they are on that first shelf and I felt like it was only fair to include them in this series. Okay, now officially moving on to that second shelf. First, I have have Eleanor Oliphant. It's completely fine by Gail Honeyman. This is a very character driven narrative that follows obviously Eleanor Oliphant. Now Eleanor is a very quirky character. I feel like quirky is an understatement. She lives a life of very very strict routine. She has a weekly scheduled phone call with her mother and every Friday night she falls asleep to vodka and pizza and she's terrible with social interactions and so she does everything that she possibly can to avoid them. She's also one of those characters that has very little filter. She's very very blunt and honest and so naturally she does have social deficiencies and not everybody views her as a likable person so she doesn't really have a lot of friends. But things kind of start to change when she meets Raymond who is the new IT guy at her work. Eleanor offhand dislikes Raymond because she finds him very disgusting and slobby and he's a smoker and she's just very not pleased with him overall. But then one day she and Raymond help save an elderly man who has fallen in the street and in combination with saving this man and checking up on him and building a friendship with that man they also build a a friendship and a connection with each other. So yes, this is a very character driven narrative. In fact, I would say this is almost a character study of Eleanor Oliphant. I found that this was wonderfully written. I felt that Eleanor was a very fascinating character. I can't necessarily say this was an enjoyable book because Eleanor was obviously very frustrating at points and unlikable, which she in this book, she is a very unlikable person. She doesn't get along with any of her colleagues and she doesn't have any friends. And this does deal with some deeply disturbing topics that actually go hand in hand to why Eleanor is the way that she is. And so throughout this book, you're not just following Eleanor's life as it is, but as it was and how she's kind of now starting to learn to cope with the trauma that happened to her. So I didn't necessarily outright love the story, but I found myself very charmed by the story, very charmed by the relationship that developed between Eleanor and Raymond. And so I just found myself enjoying learning about Eleanor's story and going along with it and seeing how her character progressed and developed. Next, I have The Night Swim by Megan Golden. This was my very first experience with Megan Golden and I enjoyed this immensely. So this is following our main protagonist, Rachel, who is a true crime podcaster. And after the very first season of her true crime podcast, she kind of blew up because it helped exonerate an innocent man. And for her next case, she's heading to a small town in North Carolina to cover an active rape case as it is being tried. And she plans on sharing all of the details with her following. Rachel has always been an anonymous podcaster. Nobody is supposed to know her true identity, but once she gets to town, it's clear somebody knows who she is and somebody is actively seeking her help and attention to help solve a cold case that happened about 30 years prior in the early 1990s when a girl named Jenny Stills supposedly drowned. It's Jenny's sister, Hannah, who has contacted Rachel and she doesn't believe that her sister drowned. And so through a series of letters, she is telling Rachel what happened in the days leading up to Jenny's death and what she actually believes happened. So this is actually told in three distinct voices. You have Rachel in the present as she's investigating the rape case. You have Hannah's voice in letters telling of the past with Jenny. And then you actually have the podcast element as Rachel is putting together the show about the rape trial. I very much enjoyed my reading experience of this. I found myself engrossed from start to finish. My only real main criticism about this book was the disconnect because there was no direct connection to any of the cases. So for example, in the present, Rachel has no connection to this rape case or the people in the rape case. She is covering it from a distance. And in the past case, she is getting everything 
from Hannah, but Hannah herself was not directly involved with what happened to her sister. So Hannah is already disconnected from that crime and then Hannah is relaying the crime or what she thinks to be a crime to Rachel. So I definitely felt a sense of disconnect with regard to those perspectives. This was definitely very plot driven. You are meant to want to keep turning the pages and it absolutely was. So even though I didn't get like that emotional connection to it that I might normally want, I felt like this was a very solid suspense thriller and, and I definitely plan on continuing with her. Next I have Pretty Little Wife by Darby Kane. It was a tagline for this one that really really got me because essentially it says shouldn't a dead husband stay dead this follows our main character Lila and her husband they live in this small college town where her husband is actually a very beloved high school teacher and recently there has been some student disappearances and Lila's husband actually ends up going missing as well the whole town is up in arms about this and Lila is upset too but not for the reason you think Lila was the last person to see her husband's body but now he's gone so he is missing but not in the way that everyone else things. That tagline for this book really, really got me. And so I was definitely excited to pick this one up and it really, really didn't disappoint. What I remember liking most about this story, aside from the different twist it took on the domestic suspense thriller, was Lila because Lila was a very steadfast character. She didn't flinch. Even when she became the main suspect in her husband's disappearance, she gave no ground whatsoever. I just appreciated her character so much and what she went through and what she was willing to do to take action and stop what was happening. And I don't really want to say more about that because that's part of the fun of this that's part of the twist of this so I highly recommend if this sounds interesting at all to you because it was definitely a different take on the typical domestic suspense thriller and I enjoyed this one immensely next I have Miracle Creek by Angie Kim so this is actually a courtroom drama for the most part you are getting multiple character perspectives and some of it is in the courtroom and some of it is outside of the courtroom in present day and then also in the past kind of leading up to the events the main focal point of this is a family called the Yu's and and they run a special treatment center that uses a hyperbolic chamber that is used to treat a variety of illnesses. And so several people are able to use this chamber at once and then one day there is a catastrophic fire and two people wind up dead. And so of course the trial associated with that, that is because it is believed the mom of one of the victims actually orchestrated the fire to get rid of her child. So the courtroom drama is not about the business itself and the people who ran the business, but it is about this mom and how they think that she was the one that did it. I felt like this was a very well done courtroom drama legal thriller. And of course you're following the different characters and their experiences in the hyperbolic chamber and what they're using it for and their own version of events. And so I overall really enjoyed my reading experience with this one. And even if you are not typically a courtroom drama legal thriller type of person, I feel like you can really get a lot out of this because there is a lot more going on than that. There's a lot more happening behind the scenes. And so this was very well crafted and I recommend. Next I have Tell Me Everything by Erica Krause. So I would say that this is part true crime investigation and part memoir. And I actually thought it was a very well crafted narrative. So this follows the author who actually kind of unexpectedly becomes a private investigator. And one day a lawyer actually hires her to investigate a sexual assault accusation against members of a college football team. And Krause herself has actually a severe history with sexual violence and so she knows that she should probably turn this down but she doesn't and so she spends several years kind of learning what happened investigating these football players investigating the university and its culpability and she kind of uncovers this culture of sexual assault and the university turning a blind eye to it and as she's investigating this kind of reaches a national level of notoriety and it almost becomes this landmark civil rights case as well and I just found this to be very well written I appreciated the fact that a lot of the times when I was reading this it actually kind of read like fiction and I think that's a hallmark of a great nonfiction narrative because sometimes they can be very very dry and that's something that keeps a lot of people from reading nonfiction is because of that and she did a great job of using the true crime investigation as a catalyst for introducing her own personal experiences like it all flowed really well and meshed really well together I can say that when you read this you are absolutely going to be infuriated about some of the things that are uncovered and how culpable the actual university was and what was happening to these women and how very little importance was placed on consent it was absolutely atrocious how women were used to kind of bribe and entice 
football players or potential football players to play for this university. It was horrendous. I can't even believe that these things happen and that they feel like women are such objects that they could get away with this. So I feel like this is a great combination between a nonfiction memoir and a true crime book. And if you're interested in this story or in something similar, I would absolutely recommend because I thought that this was very well done. Next I have We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lange. And this is actually, I would categorize this as a family drama. So the main character of this story is Sunday Brennan. She is living in LA very, very, very far away from her family who I believe are in New York. She actually ran away from her family and her town several years prior and nobody really knows the true reason for why she did that. But at the very start of the story, she's been in a horrific car accident and one of her older brothers actually flies out there to make sure that she's okay and decides that she needs to be taken home so that she can mend and kind of get herself together because she has been very, very struggling during her time in LA. But of course, it's not really an easy return for Sunday because not only did she desert her family, but she deserted her high school sweetheart. They had been together for several years. They were likely going to get married and then something happened that caused her to run away. And so you're really following her as she goes and she tries to not only rebuild her life, but rebuild the relationships that she destroyed when she left so unexpectedly. So that includes her brothers and her father. And yes, this sweetheart who is now, I think, possibly married and has a son, if I remember correctly. So he's currently unavailable, but there's a lot of things that are unresolved between them. And this was very much an important pivotal relationship in both of their lives that was so abruptly ended. I thought that this was a very poignant and well done family drama. It is pretty short, but you still get a good emotional connection to the characters. So there are definitely complex family relationships. There are secrets. It just had kind of the whole gamut of what you would be expecting in a family drama. And I really much enjoyed this one. Next we have the people we keep by Allison Larkin. So I want to say that like right off the bat, I got Taylor Jenkins read vibes from this, not just because Julia Whalen was the audiobook narrator for it, but just because of the overall tone. This book is historical ish. It is set in the early 1990s. And I just had a feeling that this was going to be like a character deep dive that we typically get in a Taylor Jenkins read book. And I wasn't really wrong. Now this is definitely not the caliber of Taylor Jenkins read like nothing ever is that's almost impossible these days. But I still very much enjoyed my reading experience of this. The story follows our main character April who is just 16 at the time that this story begins and she has had a pretty rough life so far. She's living alone in a motorless motorhome that her dad won in a poker game. Her dad is pretty absent. He's not there. Kind of paying more attention also to his girlfriend and his girlfriend's son. So April is very much on her own. April is struggling. She's failing out of school. She's working at a diner that she's been at since she was 12 years old and she's just dreaming of something so much bigger. She wants to be a singer songwriter. She wants to be a musician and so she has very big dreams. And then one night after a particularly awful fight with her dad. April knows that she can't take any more. She has to get away. And so she does. And she really has no plan. She has no direction. She doesn't really have any money. And so over the course of three or four years, you're following what happens and what she goes through during this time. I was definitely right there invested in April's journey as she was going through life, struggling, meeting new people. I was rejoicing when she finally found people that she could build a family with and people who loved her and treated her as she deserved to be treated. And then of course, being frustrated with her when she made terrible decisions and ran away because that was like her MO. She would get something good and then she would push it away and then run away from her problems. But at the fundamental core of all that was that she really truly just didn't believe that she deserved to be loved. She had been abandoned. I think if I remember correctly, her mom had abandoned her. I think that might be like the root of all these issues. So she just really didn't feel like she deserved to be loved. And so anytime something good came her way where people were caring about her, she just, her instinct was just to run away. And so you would get really frustrated with her over that. I just thought that this was a lovely story. There is very little plot. It really is all about April and and following her story throughout this time. And while April can be frustrating, I was just glad to be able to know April and follow her through a short period of time. So this was a strong one for me. I really enjoyed it. Next, I have Too Good to Be True by Carla Lovering. So the tagline for this book is one love story, two marriages, three versions of the truth. And that's absolutely what this is. So this follows our main character, Skye, who after a whirlwind courtship with a somewhat older man gets engaged to her fiance, Burke Michaels. But what she doesn't know is that Burke is hiding a secret because he is already married. So you're following Skye in the present and her relationship with Burke and what happens when she uncovers the truth. You're getting Burke's perspective through a series of letters that his therapist has asked him to write. And then you're actually getting a perspective from 30 years prior. You're following a character named Heather who is actually... 17 at the time and who is dating a 17 year old Burke at this time. And you obviously don't know immediately how that past perspective influences the present, but it all kind of comes together. This is definitely one that I would 
consider a popcorn thriller because it was just delicious and something that you really didn't want to put down. I found this to be very compulsively readable. It was definitely very fast paced. It was very plot driven. I still felt you got quite a lot from the characters though. You got a lot of Sky, you got a lot of Burke, you got a lot of Heather. So I didn't necessarily hate that it was fast paced. And I have to hand it to the author because the past timelines and how they connect to the present, I didn't really see coming. I thought that that was very clever and well done. I think my main complaint about the book was just that the ending was very lackluster and anticlimactic. I didn't really feel like there was a lot of justice or an overall satisfying conclusion and I kind of thought it was unrealistic and so that was enough for me to like want to knock it down a star but overall I thought that the reading experience was pretty enjoyable and so I'm willing to read more from this author in the future. Next I have Breathless by Amy McCullough. So this I would consider one of those wintry isolation type thrillers. It's following a journalist named Cecily Wong. She has actually been invited to climb a mountain called Manasli which is the eighth highest peak in the world to get an exclusive scoop with a mountaineer named Charles McVeigh who was on a mission to summit the highest peaks in a certain amount of time, but he will only give the scoop to Cecily if she goes along with him. But soon, climbers in the expedition are starting to die, and Cecily is starting to realize that something is very wrong, and somebody may actually be a murderer that is with them. And so it is about her trying to stay alive, not only as a climber on this mountain, which is already very dangerous, but trying to thwart whomever might be killing these climbers. Overall, I had a very positive reading experience with this. I thought that it was a pretty well done isolation thriller. You can definitely get those winter chilly vibes. I felt like there was an added intensity to this because they were climbing this mountain which is already dangerous enough so it's not like they were just stranded at a ski lodge but they were already actively stranded into a survival situation just from the beginning just by climbing this mountain. And this is also a great situation where you actually do learn quite a lot about the technicalities of mountain climbing so it was interesting to read about that as well. So Overall, again, this was a strong reading experience, which is why I decided to keep it on my shelves. Next, I have The Silent Patient by Alex Michaelides. So this book basically took the world by storm and it's still pretty popular and it still gets pretty high praise. I don't necessarily think I loved it as much as everyone else did, but I enjoyed it enough to keep it and to continue with Alex Michaelides. So this essentially follows a wife who seemingly has a perfect life, but one night she shoots her husband five times, no explanation, and has been silent ever since. She has spent the past several years in a mental institution and now a new doctor there named Theo Faber is determined to get her to talk. He is sure that he can get her to talk. So you're getting Theo's perspective in the present as he is investigating Alicia. You are also getting a lot of his own background and history as well. So it is very much a case study of both him and Alicia. Then you're getting Alicia in the past kind of leading up to what actually happened. And there is definitely a connection between Theo and Alicia that is revealed over the course of the book. I did not necessarily predict the twist. It didn't blow my mind or anything, but I can understand why people liked it. So overall, this was a fairly positive reading experience for me. The Maidens, on the other hand, was not. I did not really love this book, to be honest. It was very mediocre. And to be honest, I've almost completely forgotten the entirety of what this book was about. This was labeled as dark academia. I remember not getting dark academia vibes from this at all. It definitely didn't satisfy those cravings. This follows our main character who is currently still grieving the unexpected loss of her husband. But what really keeps her going and grounded is her niece, Zoe, who she has raised since she was a small child. And now Zoe is off at Cambridge. And one day our main character, I can't even remember her name. What is her? What is her name? Mariana. So one day Mariana gets a frantic call from Zoe saying somebody on campus has been murdered and she thinks it's her friend because she hasn't heard from her friend for a while. So of course Mariana heads to Cambridge first thing. Cambridge is actually her own alma mater and so she's going to go there and she's going to be there with Zoe. And soon she meets an American professor of Greek tragedy called Edward Fosca and she almost knows instantly that he is a killer. She just gets bad vibes off of them. And that is only increased when she realizes that he kind of has this special, possibly inappropriate relationship with a group of girls who he calls the maidens. These are like special students who he gives extra attention. It feels very secret society, cultish almost in a way. And Mariana doesn't like this. She does not like what she is seeing and she is bound and determined to prove that Edward Fosca is the killer. I just found this very lackluster. I found it somewhat predictable overall and I feel like it's naturally predictable just because Mariana's focus is so solely entrenched on Fosca that you know that that can't possibly be true or the full version of it. So the whole story is about her focusing on Fosca but because you as a reader, especially if you were a veteran suspense thriller reader, you basically know that this is BS. You know that it's probably not going to turn out the way that he wants you to make it think that it is and so you're kind of like in the background trying to piece all these things together while Mariana is so focused on Fosca. And also because of this, Alex does throw like a couple of characters in here that don't really have anything to do with the story, but he wants 
to point you in that direction too. He wants you to think, okay, it's Fosca. Okay, it's these two characters that were thrown in here and have absolutely no other reason for being in the story but being suspects. So I didn't really love this one. I gave this a three stars. I really don't remember anything that happened in here. And the only reason why I'm keeping it, to be honest, is because I have The Silent Patient on my shelf. So this is possibly one I may consider unhauling in the future, especially if I read another Alex Michaelides in the future and don't like it. Next, I have Long Bright River by Liz Moore. So this is one that actually took me by surprise and I flew through it in 24 hours, which I was not really expecting. It is rather chunky and it seemed offhand that this might be kind of like a cop procedural or a more standard detective fiction. That wasn't really what this is. The main character overall, is Mickey who is a police officer and she is concerned about her sister. They live in Philadelphia in a city that is being rocked by the opioid crisis and her sister Casey has definitely fallen victim to the opioid crisis and Mickey has not heard from her sister in a while. She thinks that something terrible has happened to her and so she starts to investigate what possibly has happened to Casey. Mickey's worry is also fueled by the fact that there have been a string of murders recently and Casey kind of fits the victim profile so that actually heightens Mickey's sense of alarm about what's happening to her sister. So you're getting two perspectives. You're getting the present day timeline as Mickey's investigating, but you're also getting flashes to the past with the sisters and how they grew up because they used to be quite close and then they both went into very, very different directions. So this is not, I would say, an edge of your seat suspense thriller. I wouldn't even necessarily say that this is a page turner. However, it was so dark and gritty and real and I just wanted to know what happened and that's what really kept me going and kept me wanting to turn the pages and like I said I flew through this in 24 hours and also again this is not a standard cop procedural or piece of detective fiction this is really about one woman's mission to save her sister. I said in my Goodreads review that this is dysfunctionality done well. It's got often dislikable but redeemable characters fighting to survive and I would absolutely read more from this author in the future. Next I have The Holdout by Graham Moore. This was another so clever and well paid taste courtroom drama. This follows our main character Maya Seal and she was on the jury for a trial that centered around a young black teacher who was accused of killing a young white student of his and everybody said that he was having an affair with her and just killed her to end the affair. But Maya was convinced of his innocence or at the very least she was convinced that there was enough reasonable doubt to acquit this person which is really how the justice system is supposed to work right? If there's reasonable doubt you are supposed to acquit the person. You are not supposed to convict the person and she ended up convincing some of the other jurors to agree with her her and so this man was let go. But immediately after the trial and in the years following, a lot of the jurors were not able to move on. They were kind of shunned by society. They had a hard time getting jobs. Everybody wondered how they could let this man go when it was seemingly obvious that he had committed this crime. Now in the future there is this true crime docuseries happening and they want to bring all of the former jurors back together to kind of discuss what happened back then. And they are enticing them by saying that there is some apparently new evidence that shows the man was actually guilty. But after they've all reused United, one of the jurors that Maya had a close relationship with actually winds up dead in Maya's hotel room. And so now that there's a new crime to focus on and Maya is at the center. So this follows the present day investigation of what happened to this juror, but then it's also woven with the past trial. And I thought it was done so well. And then of course the past meets the present and you find out what it all means. Now this book did have the weakness that I often find in books like this, where there is a lot of characters and you're getting multiple different perspectives where you don't get that emotional connection. And while that was definitely the case here, I found like this was so compelling and engaging that I wasn't as disconnected as I felt like I might be if another author had been telling the story. And so even though this was very plot driven. I found myself very engaged, wanting to turn the pages. And this is another one I highly recommend if you like courtroom drama, legal thrillers, or maybe even if you don't, I feel like you can get some great enjoyment out of this one. So that's why I wanted to keep this one on my shelves. Next, I have The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. So this is set in two timelines. You have a very historical timeline that is set in 1791 and it follows Nella. She runs an apothecary shop that, you know, sells the standard tinctures and medicines that one might normally expect from an apothecary. But what she is really known for is something more sinister, murder specifically the murder of men who have wronged women. So Nella has experienced this horrible loss, this horrible trauma, and it kind of took her off her path as a healer to one that was more vengeful. And she has this very elaborate secretive system in place for women who need to contact her and who are in need of her assistance. And then in the present day timeline, you were following Caroline. She is taking a trip on what was supposed to be the 10th anniversary with her husband, but she uncovers a horrific betrayal on his part. He has cheated on her. And so she decides to go ahead and take the trip alone to get some space and clear her head and kind of grieve the loss of this relationship. And while she's on this trip, she finds herself on this unexpected mud larking excursion and she uncovers a mysterious blue vial. And Caroline is very intrigued by this blue vial. She wants to know where it came from and what it was for. And so she starts investigating 
where this might have come from. And she uncovers the fact that this blue vial may have belonged to a serial killer in the 18th century. Overall, I found this to be fairly fascinating, atmospheric. I found it to be charming. And with regard to Nella's mission of vengeance and to help women who have been wronged, I found that to be quite endearing and honest. I found it to be very, very redeemable because I think we can all relate in some form or fashion. Like these were legitimately bad men. A lot of them were very abusive men. It wasn't just a matter of them like cheating on these women. They were legitimately dangerous men who needed to be taken care of. I really wish that there had been a deeper dive into Nella's character and I wish that she had been more steadfast. And what I mean by that is Nella seemed to be deeply plagued by her conscience. And I guess that's something you could possibly expect from a very realistic character who is actively murdering people or indirectly murdering people by the potions that she was brewing for them, right? I kind of wanted her to be a more solid source of retribution and vengeance. Somebody who didn't flinch, somebody who took care of business and didn't care and was gonna do what she had to do to right these wrongs and help these women. That's kind of more of what I was looking for in Nella. I was looking for just this Dexter-like character who didn't really care and was doing it with no emotion and no remorse. I also found the present day timeline a little bit lackluster just because I felt like Caroline's investigation happened very, very easily. You have to consider that we are investigating something that happened in 1791 when there was not nearly the technology and the resources that we have today. And to be able to find all of the information that she did that led her to uncovering this apothecary and what was going on in it, I felt like that was way too easy. I felt like that was all uncovered very, very quickly and it was a little bit unbelievable. Caroline actually found the location of this hidden apothecary from 200 plus years ago that apparently nobody else had ever found before. I found that to be a little bit unbelievable and convenient. So overall, the story had a lot of potential. I definitely thought it was engaging. I definitely thought it was entertaining and atmospheric, and I'm absolutely willing to give Sarah Penner another try in the future. So this didn't blow me away, but I enjoyed it well enough to go ahead and keep it on my shelves. Next, we have two from one of my favorite authors of all time. I have Daisy Jones and the Six and Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This story is written as a VH1 style tell-all regarding Daisy Jones and a band called The Six back in the 1970s. And of course, Daisy Jones and The Six exper experienced their fair share of drama during this time, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and all of the drama that goes along with it. This is uniquely told through a variety of different snippets of interviews. It's not like a question and answer type interview. It's like kind of told through cut and paste answers from these different interviews woven into one comprehensive narrative. And as you would expect from Taylor Jenkins Reid, she made each one of these characters so real, so vivid, so distinct. When you listen to the audiobook, which is definitely the way to go for this one, I believe. I feel like it could be a little bit of a jarring experience if you are reading this physically, but you need to listen to it via audiobook because each character does have their own different narrator and it just works so well, especially with the way that this is told and the style that this is told. And because she made them sound so real, you kind of just wanted to immediately stop the book and go listen to the music. And so for that reason, even though I'm nervous about it, I'm happy that it's getting an adaptation because I want to hear the music. I want to hear what they created because some of the songs and the lyrics just sounded so amazing and beautiful. And I just love the way that Taylor Jenkins Reid is able to make these characters pop off the page, make you believe that they are real. In Evelyn Hugo, you felt like you could get up and go watch her movie. And in this, you felt like you could go and play the music of Daisy Jones and the Six. And yes, you know, this book definitely has some of the things that you would expect to see during this time. Were these characters often unlikable? Yes. Were you seeing a lot of the typical rock and roll style behavior? Definitely. And so if that bothers you, just keep that in mind because, you know, this is rock and roll during the 70s. But also, again, these characters were so rich. They were so unique. And all I can say is that I was sad when this was over. I didn't want it to end. I wanted more from these characters. And so I'm interested to see what the adaptation is going to do for it. Highly, highly recommend. Then we have Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This was her newest release prior to the recently released Carrie Soto is Back. Carrie Soto actually does feature in this story as a minor character, but one that actually has a significance to some of the events that happen in here. This is actually following the Rivas family. Now, if you're not familiar, the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo, Daisy Jones, this, and Carrie Soto all kind of take place in the same world. And some of them do have crossover characters, one of the main ones being Mick Rivas. Now, Mick Rivas is the father of this family that is depicted in this book, but Mick Rivas is a very terrible, absent father. He's a very selfish man who kind of basically abandoned them all multiple times over their lives. And so this is definitely told over two timelines. You're following the present day, which in this story is 1983. And Nina Rivas is about to host her annual blowout party that she typically does. And it is also told in the past perspective as you're following Mick Rivas as he meets and falls in love with the mother of the children that we're following in the present day. 
So in that 1983 timeline, you are following the events leading up to the party. You're following the individual Rebus siblings and what is going on in their lives, the conflict that is likely to ensue and that all comes to a head at the party. And then, like I said, in the past, you're following Mick Rebus, who is the father of these children and what happened with their mother and all of that stuff. I would actually say that the weakest part of the story for me was actually the party itself when we get to it. And that is because during the party, there were all of these random snippets of different characters and their experiences at the party and what was going on. And I can kind of understand why Taylor Jenkins Reid did that is because there's a party going on, right? You're supposed to be following what's happening at the party and the guests and stuff at the party. But what you really want to see is what's happening with these siblings because they're all dealing with their own stuff. They all have their own drama going on and you're invested in that and you want to see how it's all going to conclude in the end when all of like these secrets are revealed and things start to happen. But you're also, like I said, getting these random snippets of party goers that really have no relevance on the story and don't really need to be included and just kind of take you out of the story. Because the Rivas children are so wrapped up in their own personal drama, they aren't even focused on the party or connected to the party in any way. They're like not even really active participants in this party. So you're seeing the party through the perspectives of these guests. So again, I understand why Taylor Jenkins Reid did that. It wasn't my favorite. It did kind of take me out of the story. So this is not my favorite, but still it's another strong character-driven narrative where Taylor Jenkins Reid is able to bring these characters to life so magnificently. And I still gave this one a four stars. So of course I recommend. All right, and the final two books on the shelf are actually Riley Sager. It begins my Riley Sager collection. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over the two that were actually on the shelf. These are not in order of publication. So they're definitely not going to be in any particular order. I'm just gonna talk about these two today and then we'll get in the rest in the next video. First, I actually have Riley Sager's newest release and that is The House Across the Lake. So this is following Casey Fletcher. She was a formerly well-known actress and she has actually been recently widowed and she's taking this very hard. Her career is basically down the toilet and her her husband is gone and she's basically self-medicating with alcohol and so she has been sent by her mother to their family's lake house in Vermont to kind of get her stuff together to enjoy the peace and quiet and just be out of the spotlight in a way so that she can kind of heal from her loss and try to get back on track. But Casey is not giving up the booze and she also supplements the booze with basically spying on her neighbors because across the lake she is witnessing the drama of Tom and Catherine Royce who is this very glamorous couple who live in this beautiful house and with a pair of binoculars she can basically see everything that is happening inside. And one day while she's out on the lake Casey actually saves Catherine from drowning and they kind of strike up this friendship. And as this friendship develops and the more that Casey is watching them, Casey kind of realizes that there's something a little bit off in their marriage, which just further fuels Casey to watch. And it makes her very suspicious when Catherine suddenly disappears. Catherine is not witnessed in the home. Catherine is not responding to Casey's text messages. And so Casey becomes consumed with finding Catherine. One of the main complaints that I heard about the story, and I can understand why, is that you have a trope that is now often too frequently used in suspense thrillers, where you have a woman, she is an alcoholic, thereby making her unreliable, and she is spying on somebody and she thinks she witnessed something that might not have happened. Because she's an alcoholic, because she's unreliable, nobody really believes she saw what she saw. You know, the woman in the window did this, the girl on the train did this. So it is definitely an overused trope at this point. And I recognize the validity of that grievance. I will say that the main character in this is very, very self-aware. She knows that she is a drunk and there's a reason why she remains a drunk. She has no intention of really ever quitting the alcohol just because of past experiences, past memories. She does not want filling her brain at all times. So there is definitely a self-awareness about the main character in this story. My issue with this was just the constant mention of drinking and our character grabbing a drink and lifting her glass and taking a drink. Like, I get it, okay? She's a drunk. She likes to drink. It didn't have to be mentioned like every other sentence in this book. And that's probably one of my main complaints about this book is that that was what this was for the majority of it. Casey taking a drink, Casey spying on her neighbors, passing out, rinse, repeat. Now, something I do want to say about this book that really caught me off guard. If you have read a lot of Sager books, you know that he often toes the line between real and supernatural. You never know whether it's actually a supernatural thing or if it's just, you know, a Scooby-Doo type situation where there's just a man in a mask doing these things. So Sager kind of jumps over that line in this book and I didn't love it. I didn't really feel like it fit. It didn't really feel believable to me. And I had a problem with that. 
So it did end up being fairly interesting, like the way that he used it and what was actually happening. So I kind of enjoyed that, even though it was a little bit out of left field for me. Overall, I found myself very underwhelmed by this story. It wasn't terrible, but it definitely wasn't the best. It definitely wasn't a favorite of his. I actually like Survive the Night more, which is probably an unpopular opinion because that seems to be the most consistently hated Riley Sager book up to this point. So this wasn't terrible, but it wasn't my favorite. I gave it a three stars. And then we have Home Before Dark, which is definitely one of my favorite Riley Sager books that he has written. This follows our main character, Maggie, and 25 years prior to the start of the story, when she was just a young child, she and her parents moved into Bainberry Hall, which was this large Victorian mansion style home in rural Vermont. But what they didn't know is that the house had a history and the house remembers. Just 20 days after they moved in, they hurriedly depart from the home, leaving everything behind. And then Maggie's father actually goes on to write a best-selling novel about their experiences in the home during those 20 days. Unfortunately, this book really brings nothing but misery to Maggie. And 25 years later, she's still very, very resentful of it, especially because she actually believes everything in the book is a lie. She doesn't remember any of that happening and she thinks her dad fabricated most of it. But then after her father passes away, she discovers that he still actually owns Bainberry Hall and that he's kind of left it to her. And so much to her surprise and really, really wanting answers, she decides to go back to Bainberry Hall, not only to clean it up and get it ready to sell, but to see if she could uncover the truth of what actually happened 25 years ago. This book definitely had atmosphere down. This is exactly what you were wanting when you were going into this haunted home type of situation. And I really like the way this book was told. So you have Maggie in the present day, she's going back to Bainberry Hall, but then you get the past perspective from snippets of her father's book, which I thought was really clever and interesting. And what was most clever about it is that you soon start to see that Maggie's perspective and experiences start to parallel the experiences that her father has written about, which I thought was really well done. This book definitely exceeded my expectations, especially since I read it after the trash fire that was Final Girl. So I really, really enjoyed this definitely recommend if you are looking for those haunted house vibes. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books on that second book of the month shelf. I have been filming absolutely forever because I just cannot shut up. I talk way too long about these books. So I'm going to go now. If you have made it this far into the video, please comment down below and let me know which one of the books on the shelf you have read and was your favorite or your least favorite. If you have thoughts similar to mine, I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.